It's ten years into the first great Roman civil war. Two Roman armies square off on a battlefield. During the battle, one young soldier fights with special bravery. He's cutting through the enemy lines when he finds himself locked in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with a mighty foe. His opponent singles him out as the man to beat, and he lays into the attack with a mortal ferocity that makes it clear only one of them is going to walk away alive. But the young soldier fights his opponent off and slays him in single combat, and the enemy's comrades scatter. As the fury fades from his eyes, he looks around and sees his sight is victorious. The young man kneels down to strip his fallen enemy, but when he finally removes the man's helmet, he finds himself gazing in horror into the face of his own brother. They were in Spain, so far from their father's fields in Italy. This young man traveled all the way to this foreign land, believing that he was fighting for his country, never guessing that it was his destiny to rip apart his own household. He breaks down and weeps, and curses the gods for his unholy victory. Then he lifts up his dead brother tenderly upon his shoulder. He carries him off the battlefield, back to camp, wraps him in a costly cloth, and places him on a funeral pyre in order to cremate him following the custom by which the Romans honor their dead family members. He lights a torch, places it under the pyre. He then takes the sword which had done the hated deed, kneels over his brother, and runs himself through, so accompanying him on his journey to Hades. The soldier's name is not recorded, but his fate represented the greatest fear of many of his comrades. What son or brother, neighbor or kinsman, business partner or drinking buddy might they end up slaying on these godforsaken fields? But that wasn't the only fear. More than 400 years of concord, unity, and success had propelled Rome to the domination of her world. She was unprecedented, without peer. She had begun to seem invincible. But now the fabric that bound the Romans together was starting to unravel. Was it possible that Rome herself could fall in their lifetimes? That soldier was fighting in the army of Pompey, the subject of this biography. What does it take to command the loyalty of soldiers in times like this to preserve their will to fight? This was not a war that Pompey had started, nor was it one that he ever could have wished upon his fatherland. But the fact could not be denied. It was civil war that raised Pompey up higher than any man of his age or before and it would be civil war that would one day bring him down again. I'm Alex Petkus. You are listening to The Cost of Glory. It is our mission to retell the lives of the great Greek and Roman heroes in order to learn from their successes, harness their energy, and also, we hope and pray, to avoid their mistakes. This is part one of three of the life of Pompey, the Great. Gnaeus Pompeius, as he was called in Latin, was born in 106 BC to a good family, but not a great one. And yet in that unbelievably competitive playing field of Roman statesmanship and warcraft, Pompey rose to become the most glorious Roman who up to that point had ever lived. Even before he went to fight Sertorius, the commander of the opposing army, in that scene that we open with, even before his 30th birthday, Pompey earned the epithet among the Romans that became known to history, that is, the great, Magnus. And he kept that title as an official part of his name. He would sign his official documents with it all the way up until he was eclipsed and defeated in a bloody war by one that became even greater that is his friend and relative by marriage, Julius Caesar. Plutarch pairs Pompey with the Spartan king, Agesilaus, and like Agesilaus, who we've already covered on this show, Pompey attained near-monarchic status despite his city's republican constitution with its many attempts to check and balance him. But when the Romans called Pompey Magnus, 
the greats. It called to their minds, above all, a man whom they and all the other ancients living around the Mediterranean Sea considered the greatest man who came before, Alexander the Great, who lived about 250 years earlier. Like Alexander, Pompey was a conqueror, and he drove his people's armies further east than any had before, to many of the same territories, to Asia, to Syria, Armenia, Judea, and to the tribes along the Caspian Sea. But it wasn't just the conquests that people saw in common between the two men. Pompey was not just feared, he was loved. As a young man, Pompey even sort of resembled Alexander in his facial features. He had that same magnetic charisma and that boyish charm that somehow kept shining through even after he slaughtered his enemies, both barbarians and Romans, with uncompromising, cold-blooded force. It's strange but true that when Romans saw him marching through the streets during peacetime, they didn't talk about seeing a killer, but a benevolent man of gentle, regal dignity. And Pompey is one of the few Romans of this era that we can really say with confidence he enjoyed a happy marriage with his wife, or his wives, he had several in succession, you can still see his youthful warmth, even in the busts that they made of him in his later years. He had a broad, kindly face, and even into middle age, a sprightly, youthful cowlick lifted up his curly hair up from off his careworn forehead. But before he could become Rome's precocious golden boy, he had to survive into manhood, and that almost didn't happen. One evening, an 18-year-old Pompey is sitting at dinner in a tent in his father's army camp. Pompey, against the usual Roman custom, would usually sit instead of reclining to eat, which was taken as a sign of his vigilance and his toughness, when all of a sudden, someone hands him a letter under the table. Many men, after reading its contents, would have stood up in a panic, but Pompey quietly puts the letter down and keeps eating as if it were just another matter of routine business for the general's son. Here's a little bit of context. Pompey's father, Gnaeus Pompeius Strabo, or just Strabo for short, is the commander, the proconsul, of the 15,000-odd soldiers in this camp. He's a harsh, cunning man, and he's not particularly well-liked by his soldiers or by Roman polite society, but Strabo is now asking these troops to do much more than they'd signed up for. It's 87 BC. For four years already, these men have fought through the bloodiest conflict that Italy has witnessed in five generations. It was called the Social War. Rome's many Italian allies, powerful, independent cities and states that helped Rome secure dominance over the entire Mediterranean, long resentful of the fact that the Romans have denied them citizenship, rose up and declared independence. And Strabo's men are among the loyalist troops who have done the dirty work of putting that rebellion down. It's almost over now. But now, for the first time in the history of the Republic, a violent conflict is breaking out between the leaders of the city of Rome themselves, one that would eventually lead to civil war. What happened is, the Roman politician Gaius Marius, the leader of the populist faction in Rome, manipulated the political system to strip his younger rival Sulla of his command of a war in the east, in Asia. The honor of commanding an army in a glorious campaign is maybe the greatest prize of all in Roman politics. Sulla, meanwhile, had been emerging as the figurehead of the opposite faction, namely the Optimates, the conservative old family aristocracy. In response to Marius trying to strip him of the command, Sulla decided to break with all precedent, march with his army on Rome, seize control of the city, and drive Marius and his supporters into exile. But then Sulla left for his war in the east. And now old Gaius Marius was returning to wreak vengeance. And he has help from another populist politician, Cinna, who was also driven out of the city a few months later. Now, Marius and Cinna are trying to recapture Rome in the name of the populists, otherwise known as the populares. You might call them the Democrats. Well, this conflict has now been brought to the gates of the proconsul Pompeius Strabo's camp. 
because Marius and Cinna have been demanding Strabo's help in recapturing Rome. Now, Strabo's camped out in the Italian countryside, and he's been biding his time, trying to stay neutral, to leave the nobles to quarrel amongst themselves. But in the end, he decided to throw in his lot with the optimate faction, Sulla's faction, who held the city, and they were opposed to Marius and Cinna. But many among Strabo's soldiers thought he chose wrong. Which brings us to the message that has just found its way to the dinner table of our hero, the proconsul's 18-year-old son. According to the secret message, young Gnaeus Pompey's own tentmate, Terentius, has taken a bribe from Cinna himself and was planning to murder Pompey that night, to set fire to the general's tent, to steal the army for the populists. Terentius, a man young Pompey is now looking at, sitting across the table, toasting the health of Pompey. Pompey toasts Terentius back. He takes an extra long swig of wine and asks for another. He cracks a few more jokes. Then he retires to his tent and takes action. He stuffs pillows under his blanket, sneaks out the back, stations an extra guard around his father's tent, and waits. Late in the night, Terentius creeps in with his sword drawn, then he stabs the bed again and again. Then he realizes what's happened. He sounds the signal. His fellow conspirators throughout the camp tear down their tents. They seize their arms. They start raising the mutiny. General Strabo knows what's happening now. He calls his guards to arms. He waits in his tent. It's too dangerous to go out. Where's Gnaeus, his son? What would you do in that situation if you were young Pompey? Your camp is filled with confusion. The only people who know what's going on are a group of angry men determined to kill you and your father. Well, Pompey doesn't wait in the shadows. He walks out in the open and he begins excoriating the men who have betrayed him and his father, tears streaming down his face. He calls the men by name as he sees them. And the soldiers look on. The mutineers shout angry insults back at him, but nobody dares touch him in this mixed mob. Pompey walks to the gate of the camp and throws himself down in front of it. It's a gesture that says, Go ahead, go to Cinna, go on, leave, but you'll have to trample me first, then I'll see you in hell. It's the kind of thing I imagine he said at that moment, at least, as he lay there. Well, the men drop their weapons in shame and they return to their senses. The conspiracy has failed. Now, Pompey had some reason to be confident that his boldness would pay off here. See, these weren't just any soldiers. Many of these men were personal clients of his father. Now, Pompeius Strabo was one of those rare new men at Rome, a novus homo, a man who was the first in his family to become consul, the highest office in the state. And by the way, it's kind of amazing to think that also in this army at this time is another man destined to become a famous novus homo, the young Cicero. And not just him, but Catiline as well. Blows my mind, if you've listened to our series on Catiline. Well, anyway, General Strabo was a Roman, but his real power base is not at Rome. Rather, it's in a territory on the other side of Italy, the eastern side, called Picenum. So if Italy's the boot, Picenum is the thick part of the calf. Rimini and Ancona are now, roughly speaking, in Picenum. And Pompeius Strabo is practically a local baron in Picenum. He's the big man there. And he recruited a lot of these soldiers personally from Picenum. They were clients of his. They were almost like peasants loyal to a medieval feudal lord. So young Pompey knew when the torches were lit that night and that angry mob frenzy started to kick in, if he did nothing, or if he tried to run away, then most certainly he and his father would have lost everything, probably including their lives, at the hands of their own soldiers, which happens surprisingly often these dark days in the Roman Republic. And he also knew, though, that if he had the courage to stand up and do something about it, he had the chance to force the energy back in the other direction. And that's the power of courage from a leader and not even the leader of the army, right? He didn't ask, who am I to do this? Isn't this my dad's job? He took action. I find that very inspiring. 
Now, taking initiative like this was a good rehearsal for what came next. Strabo and his son Pompey end up fighting a skirmish outside the walls of Rome with one of Cinna's generals, the man that we opened this episode with, Sertorius, a man that later ended up haunting Pompey for years in Spain. But then, after they get defeated, the father and son soon withdraw their army after failing to save the city, and Cinna, Marius, and Sertorius capture Rome for the populists, while Sulla is off far in the east, fighting his war with Mithridates. But then, Pompeius Strabo, very shortly after this, suddenly dies. One account has him struck by a lightning bolt, but another has him dying of the plague. Who knows? Either way, Strabo's army is left without a general, and in the chaos, it seems like the army more or less disbanded. And then, Pompey, this 18-year-old boy, now officially he's a man in the eyes of the Roman legal system, well, his father's many enemies now see a chance to carve up the spoils of Strabo's rich estates. And so they prosecute young Pompey himself for theft of public property after the fall of the great rebel stronghold of Asculum, after 60,000 rebels were finally subdued by 70,000 Roman loyalists. This was a huge battle, long siege. Well, these personal enemies are probably thinking, this kid doesn't stand a chance. But Pompey doesn't run away. He goes to Rome. Pompey's enemies, or his father's enemies, they're alleging that during the social war, there were many objects and treasures and monies plundered from the rebellious allies that should have been submitted to the Roman public treasury. And when the hearings start, however, Pompey is able to produce evidence that most of the thefts actually were committed by hirelings and subordinates, you know, freedmen of Strabo, and therefore not in his possession, not in Pompey's possession or his father's. However, there are a few things that I find striking that he makes no secret that he took from the city of Asculum, and that was a large collection of books and a prized stash of fine hunting nets. And this is interesting because there are many other indications that Pompey, for all that he was a very disciplined, no-nonsense military man, he was also a man of no small intellectual curiosity. And there's a story that later on in the Civil War that followed this, and we'll get to it in a moment, he captured a certain enemy of his, a man of great learning and scholarship named Quintus Valerius, and he spent an afternoon walking up and down with Valerius, questioning him on various matters. And once he found out what he wanted to know, he then followed his orders and did what he was supposed to do as a commander and ordered that the man be led off to his executioners. So he was always willing to learn from whoever he could. The hunting nets, too, are interesting. Pompey actually, somewhat uncharacteristically for a Roman noble of his time, he really loved to hunt. This might have been a Picenum thing. Picenum, again, is family's power base. It's a rugged hill country. It's good hunting country. It's also filled with warlike, independent men. In fact, that city we mentioned where the nets were taken from, Asculum, was the city where the Italian rebels first drew blood and began their revolts. It was in his family's backyard. And later, when Pompey rose to unimaginable heights, many of the men that he brought up to fame with him started out as obscure Picentine hill folk. But, you know, a Picena man, I think, would have known the value of having good hunting nets. So anyway, this early intellectual zeal I just mentioned, this curiosity of Pompey, was one of the ways that he ingratiated himself to powerful older men. And this was very important in the way that the trial played out. Because Pompey, his enemies discovered, was not the kind of kid that you could just push around. He stands up in court, he speaks in his own defense, he's, you know, brilliant. And at the end of the day, he's acquitted in the trial, and much to the credit, not just of his own words, but interestingly, to the intervention of none other than Gnaeus Papirius Carbo, who was, at this point, the man who was the second in command at Rome in Cinna's populist regime. Old Marius is dead by this point. And Carbo, 
must have seen some kind of flash of promise in Pompey to come to the aid of the son of a man who was widely hated in Rome, especially by Carbo's own party. This trial is also the way that Pompey met his first wife, Antistia, because the judge in Pompey's trial, the praetor, was so impressed with the kid that he offered his daughter in marriage to Pompey after seeing him defend himself in court. So all that's those legal troubles. That's how Pompey had to become a man very quickly. Now, it wasn't too long after this that Pompey made maybe the most consequential decision of his life. In the year 83, reports start to flood into Rome that Sulla is coming back. He's victorious from his wars in the East. And all of the populist regime's attempts at negotiation fail, and Sulla is coming back now with his army to seek vengeance upon his enemies. Carbo and Cinna start furiously raising troops. A great pitched war is on the horizon. And Pompey, now 23 years old, slips off to Picenum. Thirty years after this, a young Roman noble wrote to his friend Cicero on the brink of another, greater civil war. And he said, When parties clash in a community, it behooves a man to take the more respectable side so long as the struggle is political and not by force of arms. But when it comes to actual fighting, he should choose the stronger and reckon the safer course the better. Well, many in the regime right now at Rome think that Sulla stands no chance against the legitimate government of the Republic that has been ruling in peace for three years. Sulla is outnumbered, outfinanced, and he's clearly the aggressor now. But Pompey has a contrarian take. And when the officers of Cinna and Carbo start trying to recruit troops in Pompey's native Picenum, they and everyone else expect Pompey to fall in line and defend the regime. Instead, they discover that this 23-year-old consul's son has already consolidated a local power base, solid, loyal, Picentine men, many of them his father's former soldiers and officers. And Pompey even sets up a tribunal in the marketplace of one of the prominent cities in the region. And he's effectively appointing himself the military governor. And at his tribunal, he orders all of Carbo's men to be thrown out of the city. Pompey then places all of his chips on Sulla. And what do you know, but around this time, Cinna, the leader of the populist regime, he's out in the countryside, not too far away, and he's murdered by his own troops, which is a bizarre incident. And some people saw the hand of Pompey himself behind it. But no evidence emerged. Well, Pompey sets out on the march to join Sulla, and he doesn't want to show up empty-handed, so he's managed to recruit a full legion of soldiers to meet Sulla. That's nearly 5,000 men. This is pretty amazing, and what is striking about it is not only that he's 23 and commanding an army, but he's basically appointed himself a general of a Roman army, completely without reference to the usual procedure in the Republic. Generals are given their legal command by the authority of the state, especially of the Senate. But whose authority was Pompey commanding under? But these are the kind of moves that you can make in times of chaos like this. And Pompey figured, if he was betting right by joining Sulla, that could all be sorted out later. And he proved to be right. Now, when a Roman general is victorious in the field, especially if it was a major victory, his troops would often salute him as imperator, which means commander in Latin. It's an informal, honorific title. It doesn't carry any legal significance. But a general would typically keep that title imperator after his troops had saluted him as imperator. He'd keep it until he formally laid down his authority, say, at the end of a triumphal procession. You know, he'd address his letters as imperator so-and-so to so-and-so. And other Roman officials would salute you with that title as well and their greetings to you. So it's a big deal. Well, when Pompey approaches Sulla's camp in southern Italy after defeating a couple of seasoned Roman generals on his way, Sulla rides out to meet the boy. Sulla's maybe 50-something. 
55, I think, well, Sulla gets off his horse, which is a weighty gesture of respect. And Pompey does too, of course. He was planning to do that, but to see Sulla do that. Pompey then salutes Sulla as imperator to the amazement of everyone. Sulla, in turn, greets the young Pompey himself with the title imperator as well. Never before had this title gone to anyone so young, especially someone who hadn't held any formal office in the Republic and therefore hadn't even joined the Senate. So it's a promising start for Pompey's career there. Well, as for the rest of the Civil War, we've covered it and many of the other biographies that we've done so far, especially Sulla's. Pompey leads his men to victory after victory. He proves that he'd learned quite a bit under the apprenticeship with his father, and he becomes a star general. He's unstoppable. By 82, Sulla has captured the city of Rome back from the populists. Then he sends Pompey on a special mission to mop up some holdouts in Sicily. He gives him six legions, 30,000 men, and hundreds of ships. Pompey's mission is to eliminate the last remaining figurehead of the populist regime. It's the disgraced consul Carbo, the man who once saved him from losing his father's estate during his legal troubles in Rome. He corners Carbo on a small island off the coast and brings him to his headquarters. The men drag Carbo, the consul, in chains before a tribunal, and Pompey now sits as the man's judge. He subjects him to a lengthy cross-examination, and at the end of it, he orders Carbo to be summarily executed. And many Romans might have thought Carbo deserved a proper trial in a Roman court, he was a standing consul at this time. And this was the incident where Pompey got the nickname Adulescentulus Carnifex, Kid Butcher. Many years later, when he was the preeminent authority in Rome, Pompey was defending a client of his in some trial, and the prosecutor, his opponent, was a very old man who looked like he had one foot in the grave. And Pompey joked, Ah, this old man has come back from the underworld to make his charge. And the old man doesn't miss a beat. He says, yes, Pompey, I have come back from the underworld. And while I was there, I saw Carbo, the zealous defender of your boyhood and of your father's property, bound by the chains which you ordered placed upon him in his third consulship. When he later became a great man, Pompey had to patiently endure such insults on a regular basis. But Carbo was only one of the hundreds of leading men of Rome who died in this bloody civil war, and especially in its aftermath. Because once the civil war ended, this conflict that cost more than 100,000 Roman lives, maybe twice that number, well, once it ended, Sulla had himself declared dictator. And he declared all the leaders of the previous regime enemies of the state, this is a famous process known as the proscriptions, where he wrote the names of the men proscribed up in the forum. Then any man thus proscribed had a bounty put on his head, and his property was to be confiscated and sold, the proceeds going to the Roman treasury. And it's a horrific time that scarred itself into the memory of Romans for decades to come. It's worth noting a couple of choices, though, that Pompey made here about how to position himself vis-a-vis -vis Sulla around the end of the war in Italy. First of all, many Romans in Sulla's new regime got very rich at this time by hunting down proscribed men for big rewards, and also by offering money for the proscribed men's estates. These were trading for rock-bottom prices because Sulla was really trying to raise quick cash most famously, Pompey's rival, Crassus, built his fortune in this way, and he had a black mark on his reputation for the rest of his life as a result. See the biography that we recently did on Crassus. But Pompey was able to keep his hands clean from all of this dirty business by staying out in the field commanding Sulla's armies. Because after dealing with Carbo in Sicily, Pompey goes to North Africa to do some more mopping up of some final... Populares holdouts who raised an army from the kings of Numidia. 
And after Pompey won, as he quickly did, Plutarch says he only spent 40 days on this mission, Pompey spends a few days hunting lions and elephants. He joked that not even the wild beasts in their African lairs should be left without experience of the courage and strength of the Romans. But then what he did afterwards also showed impressive daring. When Pompey gets back from Africa, victorious again, Sulla honors him with another epithet. He bestows upon him the title Magnus the Great. Some say it was Pompey's soldiers who first addressed him as that in Africa. But either way, it was Sulla who made it official, Pompey the Great. But once he got this inch from Sulla, he asks for a mile. Pompey calls for another meeting with the dictator. He demands to have the right to a triumphal parade for his victories. He had, after all, defeated foreign enemies in the form of the armies of the barbarian kings of Numidia, who were supporting the populists. This is a huge breach of precedent, though. A triumph is the highest honor you can possibly receive in the city as an elected magistrate. But Pompey has never held any of the high offices that would qualify him for even membership in the Senate. Now, here Sulla is, trying to reestablish order Sure, he's unilaterally rewritten many aspects of the Constitution, but really he's all doing it in the name of strengthening the traditional laws of the Republic against any future populist abuses. And most importantly of all, he's trying to reassure all the survivors, it's going to be okay now. No more rule-breaking proscriptions or extraordinary commands or marching on Rome, for that matter. And it's an ancient long-standing law of the city that nobody except a praetor or a consul, the two highest offices, can hold a triumph. The great Scipio Africanus, the elder, didn't even get a triumph after he defeated Hannibal. Hannibal! Because he hadn't held the requisite high office. So Sulla tells Pompey, No! You don't even have a beard! Don't ask for a triumph! This kind of favoritism is going to make people hate me even more. But Pompey is adamant, and he eventually walks out of the meeting in frustration, and as he does, he mutters, in the presence of the man who holds life and death power over the entire Roman state, he mutters, more men worship the rising than the setting sun. And when Sulla asks one of his attendants, he could say, I'm a little hard of hearing. What did he just say? And he finds out, well, the meaning is clear. Pompey is the rising sun. Sulla is the setting sun. Well, Sulla is so stunned and impressed at the kid's boldness. Pompey is only 24. Sulla just throws up his hands and says, let him triumph. Let him triumph. And so he does. But there was another political choice Pompey made at this time. You know, and most of the surviving politicians are cowed and trembling before Sulla. It, it seems calculated to send a message. You know, I'm not Sulla's man. I'm my own man. He mobilizes a large popular fan base to support a candidate for the consulship expressly against the wishes of Sulla. This guy's name is Lepidus. And Lepidus has obvious populist leanings. And with Pompey's support, Lepidus wins one of the two slots for the consulship. Well, Sulla dies shortly thereafter in the same year. And lo and behold, when Sulla's will is read out, he left all kinds of bequests and gifts to a long list of friends and supporters. But Pompey, very conspicuously, got nothing. And there seems to have been some bad blood Sulla had compelled Pompey to divorce his first wife and marry the dictator's stepdaughter, who was already pregnant with another man's child. But this second wife of his, Amelia, died in childbirth along with the baby shortly after entering Pompey's house. And you know, for all of his harsh reputation by this point, Pompey had a tender streak, even a preference for mercy when it was possible. Though he clearly, you know, had to get rid of Carbo. There were many men proscribed by Sulla that Pompey deliberately allowed to escape into exile. 
I think considering the facts, you can see that Pompey's cold decisiveness was not the product of a harsh nature, but a recognition of the careful, hard choices that a Roman statesman of his day had to make in order to become the first man in the Republic, as he's already beginning to see that he can become someday. Take the fact, too, that after Sulla dies, this new populist consul Lepidus tries to prevent Sulla from having a state funeral, but Pompey turns around and organizes a counter-campaign, and he gets credited as the man most responsible for ensuring that Sulla gets that funeral. So even after being disinherited, Pompey shows to the citizenry and also importantly to Sulla's myriads of veteran soldiers who were settled throughout Italy, hey, Pompey's still loyal to the memory of the man who raised him up. I mean, you can't pin this guy down. But what followed showed Sulla's wisdom. And to get the context of what I'm about to tell you, you have to understand that all this time, the civil war is not really over. And soon Pompey is going to face his greatest trial yet, which is looming in the West. One general on the losing side of the populists in the Civil War had escaped to Spain. And the Romans were now realizing, to their great distress, that he might be one of the most talented commanders they've produced in generations. This was Sertorius. Quintus Sertorius was a mere commoner, a Sabine from the rustic mountain hill country near Rome. But he rose up in the ranks of the army. During the Civil War, he escaped to Spain, and then after he was driven out of the Roman province there, he allied with some corsairs, and he reestablished then a beachhead. And he's now in the process of recapturing the whole Iberian Peninsula. He's defeated every general and every army that the Optimate regime has sent at him, just like in the Civil War when he defeated Pompey and his father in the early stages at that battle outside the gates of Rome. Sertorius combined the magnetism of a Scipio Africanus, the cunning of a Hannibal, and the justice of a Cincinnatus. And now he's becoming a magnet for exiles, disaffected with the regime, who've escaped the bloody proscriptions. He's now starting to look like not just another mop-up operation, but an existential threat to the post-Sulla regime. And this problem suddenly became much more urgent when Sulla died, because this new consul, Lepidus, who Sulla warned Pompey and the Romans about, he now proposes a bill extending amnesty to all the remaining populist exiles with Sertorius. And the Optimate Senate rejects this idea forcefully. I mean, think of all the men who are now owning the properties of the proscribed. It's just unthinkable to the new establishment. But so a panic grips the city once again when Lepidus now raises an army and starts his own new rebellion. Maybe he thought Pompey would join him. Pompey was unpredictable. But Pompey now takes the side of the establishment. So the Senate charges the year's other consul, Catullus, to put down the rebellion. And also, who else but Pompey himself? Well, Catullus defeats Lepidus himself in a battle and... Lepidus flees to Sardinia and dies there of an illness shortly thereafter. But it's worth mentioning what Pompey did in this war here because it bears on the story of another famous figure that we're going to cover in this great Visions of Caesar series of biographies that we're doing. So Pompey's job in this rebellion is to go to Mutina, which is modern-day Modena in Italy. And at Mutina, an officer named Brutus has fortified the city and declared his support of Lepidus's revolt. And this man was in fact the father of the other, more famous Brutus, the man who later became one of Caesar's assassins. This Brutus Sr. is also married to Cato the Younger's half-sister, Servilia. I love the drama of these family connections in the late Republic. Well, anyway, Pompey traps Brutus Sr. in a long siege, and Brutus eventually capitulates and surrenders, and then he retires under a truce to another nearby city. But then, Pompey sends one of his trusted men and has Brutus assassinated. In his later years, this was yet another act of the young Pompey that was held up as evidence of his treacherous nature, this kid butcher. You know, Brutus is protected by a truce, right? And who knows, maybe he was 
breaking the truce himself by stirring up discontents in the area. Maybe Pompey was justified. I don't know. But either way, that story doesn't survive so much as this act of treachery by Pompey, and it becomes another black mark on his reputation. Well, anyway, after the failure of this Lepidus revolt, the consul Catullus sends orders to Pompey. Good job helping to quell the rebellion, young man. Go ahead and disband your army now. Thanks for your service. But uh, Pompey makes various excuses, and he stays with his men and keeps his legions intact. Pompey has other plans, you see. After five years of stagnating and peacetime civilian life, he's ready for another challenge. Because the Sertorian War in Spain is suddenly getting more serious, another disaffected noble from the populist party named Perperna takes command of the remnants of Lepidus' army on Sardinia. It's some 25,000 men, five legions, a formidable force. And he sails them to Spain to join Sertorius. And the Sullen regime's other senior preeminent general, Metellus Pius, is already throwing everything he has at Sertorius and getting nowhere. Meanwhile, Sertorius now controls nearly all of Spain. He's established a rival senate and elected magistrates. He's allied with the native Spaniards. He's making Roman soldiers out of them. He's acquiring a sort of legitimacy. And he's also now allied with a highly organized federation of pirates who are dominating the Mediterranean seas, Sertorius even strikes an alliance with the wily king of Pontus, Mithridates, who is clawing back power in the east after Sulla failed to annihilate him entirely. So the regime in Rome is now looking at another existential threat to their survival. Pompey is clearly the most suitable candidate to bolster Metellus, even though it's entirely against the spirit of Sulla's conservative reforms now to appoint such a man to an extraordinary command so young, who hasn't put in his time and gone through the necessary career path, who still has held no formal elected office in the Republic. But even the consuls for the year 77 are trembling at the thought of taking on Sertorius, and they find excuses to turn down the command. And so after months of lobbying, Pompey's friends in Rome at last convince the reluctant Senate, and they authorize him to recruit a massive force, 30,000 men, and march to Spain. And he hacks his way through the hostile mountain tribes of the Alps and the Pyrenees, and he finally crosses into Spain in 76. And we've covered the war with Sertorius at length in the biography we did on that incredible man, the first life we covered on the cost of glory, see especially episode three. And we've got many even greater exploits of Pompey's to get to. But a few details of this campaign will give you a sense of what Pompey was up against here. On arriving, Pompey and Metellus start coordinating their efforts to try to dislodge Sertorius from the eastern Mediterranean coast of Spain. And Pompey gets an opportunity when one of the larger towns, Lauron, defects from Sertorius to Pompey. Sertorius camps then on a hill nearby the city. Pompey hasn't made contact with the city yet. So Pompey surrounds Sertorius on the hill to get rid of him first before he can liberate the city. But he thinks, ah, I've got Sertorius cornered. And so he sends word to the city of Lauron, get up on the ramparts and watch as I teach this old man a lesson. But then, as Pompey sends his troops to start assaulting Sertorius' fortifications on the hill, suddenly 6,000 heavily armed men come out from a position of hiding directly to Pompey's rear, and they surround him. So now, if Pompey attacks either of these armies, Sertorius' other force is going to rip him apart from behind. And so, Pompey calls off his attack, while Sertorius calmly sends to the city of Lauron and accepts its surrender. And he allows all the people to leave the city, then he burns it to the ground, while Pompey and his army are staring on like cooped chickens. Sertorius was not to be taken so easily. A little later, Pompey scores a victory against a couple of Sertorius' subordinate commanders, and Pompey gets bold. He tracks down the forces of Sertorius himself, who are camped by the Sucro River, with Metellus in the neighborhood nearby. And he makes a move to strike before Metellus can get there, so he can claim the win all on his own. And they fight a hard battle. Pompey nearly loses his life. 
At the climax of the battle, he gets surrounded in a crush of foes, but then he abandons his horse and he barrels his powerful frame through a gap, then the pursuers get distracted, trying to snatch off all the gold tassels and ornamental headgear on the horse, just long enough for Pompey to get some distance and escape. And the battle ends in a brutal draw, and Metellus arrives that evening, and they're hoping to follow up Pompey's success on that day with a final blow to Sertorius's army the next day. But in the morning, they find the enemy has completely disappeared. Because Sertorius would do this, he would order his army of native Spaniards to vanish into the wilderness they were so familiar with, only to rally again together later. And Sertorius would often wander alone in the woods and later take the field again at the head of a full army, tens of thousands strong, like a dry canyon suddenly swollen from a torrent of winter rain. Well, Pompey at last goes to meet Metellus face to face. And as they meet at their rendezvous, he orders his lictors to lower their ceremonial rod axes, the fasces, in deference to Metellus, a man of consular dignity, after all. This is a sign of great respect and deference. But Metellus refused to allow it. And in all other ways, as Plutarch says, Metellus behaved with great respect for Pompey and treated him as an equal in the campaign. Again, Pompey knows how to deal with these weighty nobles. And so the war went on and on. Sertorius wore them down. Pompey, at one point, exasperated, driven out of Spain into winter quarters in Gaul, he has to write to the hesitant Senate to demand more resources. And he threatens to retreat to Italy, and he raises the possibility thereby of bringing the war all the way back to the Romans' backyard. So he gets his reinforcements. Finally, though, the balance of the war starts to swing more towards an equilibrium, and then even against Sertorius, as Pompey and Metellus capture more and more cities, and they isolate the man's subordinate commanders and defeat them in successive engagements. But it wasn't a regime army that defeated Sertorius. Perperna, the noble who brought Lepidus's failed rebel army to Sertorius, he's long been resentful at the prominence that this Sabine, this commoner, held in the resistance, while Perperna, a great man with great consuls in his ancestry, is passed over for important commands. And Perperna organizes a conspiracy among several of Sertorius's trusted officers and invites him to a dinner. And late in the evening, as Perperna drops his cup to give the signal, they leap up and stab Sertorius in the back while he's looking the other way. Perperna soon leads Sertorius's native forces into the field against Pompey, but he's utterly inferior to the man he's just assassinated. Pompey crushes Perperna's army, and the soldiers capture the assassin alive as he's hiding in a thicket of woods, and they bring him before the general. As Perperna's groveling for his life, he presents Pompey with a bombshell. Perperna can show Pompey autographed letters from leading men in the Roman Senate addressing Sertorius, letters inviting Sertorius to march on Italy, letters promising the support of powerful men of Rome when Sertorius arrives to overthrow the current regime. Pompey has a choice here to uproot a hive of sedition and discontent in the heart of the Republic. But he decides, this war has gone on long enough. He has Perperna executed. He finds the letters and burns them without reading them himself or allowing anyone else to. And thus it was Pompey who took credit for finally putting to rest the internal warring that had been plaguing Rome for nearly two decades since the start of the Social War in 91. And even though Pompey deserves a lot of praise for sparing his countrymen from another round of brotherly battles and bloody reprisals, his choice here to burn those letters that Perperna indicated, I think it can be taken as a sign that Pompey had his own plans for the Roman constitution, as surely many of the optimate stalwarts would have noted when they heard the news. Because men like Metellus and Catullus and other establishment conservatives among the post-Sulla nobility 
would very much like to ferret out any populist challengers to their authority, the very sort of people who might have been corresponding with Sertorius. But Pompey, like his father, is not an establishment conservative, as we'll continue to see. Not only does he burn those letters, he also grants an amnesty to the rest of Sertorius's army and their officers. And he settles many of them across a number of cities throughout Spain and Gaul. Pompey, by the way, claimed a fair bit of new territory for Rome during that war. They didn't control the whole of Spain yet at that point. And he also founded a few new cities. One of them is Pamplona, famous for the running of the bulls today. Pamplona is a corruption of the original name of the city that Pompey gave it, which was Pompeiello, which means something like Pompeiopolis. And Spain becomes not just a line on Pompey's resume, a medal on his sash, but a permanent power base for him, filled with clients of local Spaniards and former Roman soldiers and Roman businessmen who all owe allegiance to Pompey. Having this kind of permanent clientele was one of the things that distinguished a proper Roman noble from the herd. These kind of political and financial clientels could become hereditary. The Marcelli were still major patrons of the island of Sicily 150 years after their ancestor, the great Marcellus, liberated it from the Carthaginians. These foreign clientels were mostly forged by Roman generals through conflict, and they were one of the reasons these great foreign commands were so coveted and so guarded by the establishment nobles. But it was time now for Pompey to make his glorious return, and top of mind for him was his greatest rival at this point, another non-establishment conservative. That was Crassus. Marcus Licinius Crassus came from a noble family, and he was another protege of Sulla. But by becoming fabulously rich, the richest man in Rome, in fact, by buying up cheap the sprawling estates of proscribed men under the dictatorship, many of these men decent patriots from good families, Crassus, by this dirty profiteering, has made himself a sort of outsider from the noble circles. Nonetheless, Crassus is quite comfortable moving about the city. He's a consummate politician, and he's commanding in the law courts and the Senate House as Pompey is on the battlefield. He's also been busy. He's finishing up his own war. It's a war against the great slave revolts led by the famous Spartacus. And we covered that war in the life of Crassus already. Well, by the time Pompey gets back to Italy with his army in 71, Crassus has mostly finished off Spartacus. But the final battle to Crassus' great indignation is won by Pompey. A remnant of Spartacus' army was trying to escape north out of Italy, and Pompey corners them and annihilates them. And he writes to the Senate and remarks that while Crassus conquered the slaves, Pompey ended the war. Well, to make short a longer story that we've already covered in the biography of Crassus, he and Pompey, despite their intense competitiveness with each other, they decide that they have much more to gain by joining forces than by quarreling. Because the real obstacle to both of their ambitions is not the other man, but rather the jealous, optimate-dominated Senate. And so after Pompey's glorious triumph and Crassus's significantly less glorious ovation, which is a minor sort of silver medal version of a triumph that the Senate granted him instead, because a triumph only properly goes to victories over foreign enemies, well, Rome's two greatest up-and-coming men support each other's candidacies for consul. Crassus has his huge network of mid-status businessmen and lower-ranking senators, while Pompey, on the other hand, has this massive popular charisma as the city's greatest general. Every cart pusher and barmaid and sausage seller's wife knows his name. Well, together, they easily cruise into victory. Now, for the consulship, Crassus was old enough, but for Pompey, Crassus has the pressure of the Senate to decree an exception, because by the laws that Sulla laid down, no man was to become consul before age 42, and even then, he's not supposed to do it without first holding the more junior offices on the Roman cursus honorum, their ladder of offices. Pompey's only 35, and again, he's never held any formal office. So for him to get this exception is pretty striking. 
But that wasn't the only element of Sulla's constitution that Pompey and Crassus were going to trample on, as we'll see shortly. Now, I find this kind of hilarious. So one of the consul's primary duties is to call and officiate meetings of the Senate. They take turns from month to month doing this. And so Pompey finds himself in this amazing position of presiding over this august body, this highest institution of the state, of which he has never actually attended a regular meeting because the Senate is composed of former magistrates, which he has never been. And it, you know, it has all these complex traditional rules of order and decorum and propriety, things like, you know, you have to call on praetors and former praetors before you call on the questors and all this stuff. So Poppy's a quick study and he figures I could sort this out. So he has his friend Vero, Marcus Terentius Vero, write up this treatise on senatorial procedure. And then he reads it. And that solves that problem. Vero, by the way, goes on to become a great, famous scholar. Some of his writings actually survive. He's one of the many nobodies by birth that Pompey brought into his retinue and elevated to supreme influence at Rome. Now, I think you can kind of see Pompey as a technocrat in that respect. Well, so anyway, with this problem solved, Pompey and Crassus put forward a reform program that totally flies in the face of everything Sulla stood for, and it makes the establishment very nervous. They don't undo everything, but they pressure the Senate to repeal one key measure that would have big consequences for Roman history. Sulla wanted to restore the dignity of the Senate and respect for tradition with his reforms as dictator. And the way that old Marius and other populists like him for nearly a half a century at that point, had been manipulating the political system with dangerous innovations, was through the office of the Tribune of the Plebs, the people's representatives. The tribunes, before Sulla, had the authority to call popular votes, plebiscites, not just before Sulla, but for most of Roman history before him. So they could call these plebiscites of all the Roman people, these popular votes, and enact policies and make laws through those plebiscites. They were supposed to consult the Senate before they did this, but they increasingly realized that they didn't really have to as long as they had the Roman people behind them and some powerful patrons among the establishment who could shield them from the political payback. Well, Sulla stripped the tribunes as dictator of this and a couple of other authorities that the tribunes had, like such as the right to veto the actions of other magistrates. He also barred former tribunes from all higher offices, so they couldn't be a stepping stone to great influence, as it had, in fact, been for Gaius Marius. And so that's how Sulla drained the office of the tribune's talent pool. Well... Pompey and Crassus compel the hesitant Senate to reinstate this office of tribune with all of its former powers, and they have overwhelming support and therefore pressure from the broader Roman populace. That's the main constitutional change they make. Well, when his year is up, Pompey finally then retires to private life. And Plutarch makes a very observant comment here. He says, quote, now, Crassus continued in the manner of life which he had chosen at the outset, but Pompey ceased his frequent appearances pleading on behalf of clients and gradually forsook the forum. He then rarely showed himself in public, and when he did, it was always with a retinue of followers. In fact, it was no longer easy to meet him or even to see him without a throng around him. But he took the greatest pleasure in making his appearance attended by large crowds, encompassing his presence thus with majesty and pomp, and thinking that he must keep his dignity free from contact and familiar association with the multitude. For life in the robes of peace has a dangerous tendency to diminish the reputation of those whom war has made great and ill-suited for democratic equality. End quote. And so he kind of retires from the political fray day to day. And when you do that as a military man, Plutarch observes, you know, when you, you have your dazzle, but you refrain from throwing your weight around on various, you know, pressing issues of the day, 
then the envious career politicians tend to leave you be and they tend to leave your glory intact. And I think you could compare this to the way a man who becomes a celebrity for being successful in business, you know, if he wades into politics, suddenly he gets all kinds of scrutiny and negative press for not staying in his lane. So Pompey is savvy to this dynamic and he does his best to stay aloof. But all the same, another rival of Pompey's, the general Lucullus, has been scoring brilliant victories against Mithridates in the east. Victories arguably more glorious than Pompey's own. Well, Pompey is not even 40 years old, and he's by no means ready to retire or to give up first place to any man. So he's been scanning the horizon for opportunities. And in the year 67, one comes roaring in from the sea. Here's how Plutarch describes the pirate problem now facing Rome. Quote, The power of the pirates had its seat in Cilicia at first, that's in Asia Minor, and at the outset it was elusive, merely the work of tentative adventurers. But it took on confidence and boldness during the wars with Mithridates because it lent itself to that king's service. Then, while the Romans were embroiled in civil wars at the gates of Rome, the sea was left unguarded, and soon it drew and enticed the pirates on until they no longer attacked merely seafarers, but also laid waste islands and maritime cities. And soon, men who were influential because of their wealth, and those whose lineage was illustrious, and those who were distinguished by superior intelligence, began to embark on piratical craft and share in their enterprises, feeling that the occupation brought them a certain reputation and distinction, end quote. So in other words, the freebooters in the Mediterranean are beginning to look less like pirates and more like a well-organized, well-financed professional navy, drawing top talent from noble families among the various Mediterranean peoples whom Rome's wars is sidelined, so this is a big problem for Rome. Plutarch goes on. There were also fortified harbors and signal stations for piratical craft in many places, and fleets attacking people were not merely furnished for their peculiar work with sturdy crews, skillful pilots, and light and speedy ships. Nay, more annoying than the fear which they inspired was the odious extravagance of their equipment, with their gilded sails and purple awnings and silvered oars, as if they rioted in their iniquity and plumed themselves upon it. Their flutes and stringed instruments and drinking bouts along every coast, their seizures of persons in high command, and their ransomings of captured cities were a disgrace to the Roman supremacy. For you see, the ships of the pirates numbered more than a thousand, and the cities captured by them, 400. And uh, Plutarch goes on, they're sailing around, plundering famous temples and sanctuaries, Claros, Didyma, Samothrace, the temple of Asclepius at Epidaurus, of Hera at Samos, and the great Argive Herion. And they had their own strange religious cult, too. It was the pirates who first celebrated the secret sacrifices of Mithras at Olympus in Asia Minor. But there's more going on here. Quote, but they heaped most insults upon the Romans, even going up from the sea along their roads and plundering there and sacking the neighborhood villas. Once, too, they seized two praetors, Sextilius and Bellinus, in their purple-edged robes and carried them away, together with their attendants and lictors. They also captured a daughter of Antonius, a man who had celebrated a triumph as she was going into the country, and they exacted a large ransom for her. But their crowning insolence was this. Whenever a captive cried out that he was a Roman and gave his name, they would pretend to be frightened out of their senses, and they would smite their thighs and fall down before him, entreating him to pardon them. Then he would be convinced of their sincerity, seeing them so humbly suppliant, 
Then some would put Roman boots on his feet, and others would throw a toga around him, in order, my good fellow, that there might be no mistake about you again. And after thus mocking the man for a long time and getting their fill of amusement from him, at last they would let down a ladder in mid-ocean and bid him disembark and be on his merry way. And if he did not wish to go, they would push him overboard themselves and drown him. This power extended its operations over the whole of our Mediterranean Sea, making it unnavigable and closed to all commerce. End quote. Well, when the pirates sailed into Ostia, into Rome's main port, and they burned some ships right there in the harbor, it finally seemed like the last straw. But Pompey has some unconventional ideas about how to solve the problem. You see, Rome's typical way of assigning commands was to make a former magistrate, either a former consul, that is a proconsul, or a former praetor, a propraetor, to make them the governor of a province designated by land boundaries. And the rule was a commander had to stay in the boundaries of his province, say the island of Sicily or the territory of Macedonia. And if you didn't, you'd face prosecution at home when your tour was up. But how could you solve a Mediterranean-wide pirate problem with those rules? Clearly the best solution to the problem would require you to break the rules. And so a great, well-orchestrated political drama unfolds, and I think it brilliantly encapsulates the way that Pompey preferred to act on the stage of Roman politics. First, a friend of his, a good old boy from Picenum, Aulus Gabinius, happens to be one of the tribunes of the plebs for the year 67. Gabinius promulgates a bill and posts it in the forum for all the people to see, and if they should so will, to ratify it in a plebiscite, assigning an extraordinary command for one man to hold a three-year office comprising an extraordinary geographical scope of the entire Mediterranean and Black Seas. Makes sense. The pirates can go anywhere and do anything on the sea, right? Not only that, though, this one man was to have full military authority to the distance of 400 stades, roughly 50 miles inland from the sea. Well, the pirates have their bases high in the coastal mountains, don't they? And such a commander should be allowed to appoint 15 legates of his own choosing and have as much money as he needed from the public treasury and the tax revenues of any of the provinces. And he should be allowed to raise a fleet and an army as large as he required. Now, Gabinius did not specify who the office holder should be, but it was clear enough who he had in mind. The Senate is appalled. No Roman magistrate has ever been given this much power to conduct the war. They call a meeting to discuss the issue, and only one man in the Senate goes on record to support the bill, a young Julius Caesar. I'm sure he brought up his own embarrassing run-ins with the pirates in his youth, and we'll cover those when we get to his life. All the other dignitaries rail against Gabinius's bill in violent speeches. This is tantamount to a three-year monarchy, is it not? And Pompey's sitting there trying to play it cool and act like, wow, he's as surprised as they are at all this bill-making. But then things get heated in the meeting, and at a certain point, the consul Piso makes a veiled death threat against Gabinius and maybe somebody else in a furious speech along the lines of, don't you know what happens in Rome when you try to acquire too much power? Even the ancient Roman founder, Romulus, was, according to one legend, murdered by jealous senators for trying to acquire too much power. And let's not forget the tribunes Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus they also met their just desserts at the bloody hands of the Senate for trying to override its power. Well, this meeting starts to get rowdy, and some of the senators, in the heat of the moment, they grab hold of Gabinius while he's talking, and a scuffle breaks out. And in the tumult, Gabinius slips outside to address the people who are all crowded outside the Senate house waiting for news. They love Pompey, and they love this bill. Isn't the fate of the nation at stake? 
The pirates are threatening the grain shipments from Africa and Sicily that the Roman populace relies on for its survival. But when Gabinius tells them what happened, that the lives of Rome's defenders are in danger over this bill, the people rush the Senate house and an angry mob pours in while the senators are sitting. They seize the bill's opponents. They seize the consul Piso himself. Men are shouting. They say they're going to lynch him. But Gabinius calls them off and the meeting adjourns in utter chaos. Welp, they consulted the Senate, didn't they? Gabinius now calls for a popular assembly, a contio, an open meeting of the Roman people. And he's got another bill formally proposing, yes, that Pompey the Great take the command. Pompey's there to play his role as well. And Gabinius makes a speech and then he calls Pompey up onto the rostra. The crowd goes wild. Pompey, Pompey. Pompey calls for silence. And this is more or less the speech that's recorded by the Roman historian Cassius Dio. I rejoice, Quirites, in being honored by you. Quirites is the ceremonial name for the assembled citizenry. Nevertheless, I do not think it fitting that you should continually demand my services or that I should continually hold some position of command. Then he continues on in this vein, and the crowd groans. What? He's refusing the command? And they cry out in protest, No, Pompey, you're the man. No, no, my fellow citizens. I am exhausted. I've been commanding Rome's legions since my early youth. I no longer desire to endure the hardships and the anxieties. No, no. He makes a clarification here. Do not mistake me. It is not that I hesitate to undertake the dangers and the toils of war. No, citizens, but... Who, I say, could welcome the invidious jealousy that such a position as this would draw from one's peers? Etc., etc. No, Quirites, I am not the man for this job. And of course, this speech has the intended effect of producing the opposite mood among the plebs. They just cheer him on all the more. Ah, oh, what noble indifference to the usual rat race of personal aggrandizement among the toffs. The senators are rolling their eyes. But as Pompey finishes, Gabinius sees his cue. He stands up to speak again and hammer home the obvious point. Look at how honorably the great Pompey declines this command. He doesn't want glory for himself. Ah, but the Republic's interests must come first, query taste. It's the fate of the nation we're talking about. And no one is better suited to this immense labor but our most illustrious general of all, Pompey the Great. And the optimates scramble here. As a last-ditch effort, they try to get one of the other nine tribunes to exercise his veto and stop the bill. You'll recall that the veto is another unique power of the tribune office. And one of the tribunes stands up to do it, Trebellius. But Gabinius pulls an even wilder card out, then he calls for a vote to strip Trebellius of his office of the tribune. For the tribune's sacred duty is to represent the people, and Trebellius is most egregiously acting against the will and interest of the people. The mob roars in approval, and Gabinius has his men immediately start counting votes. Trebellius trembles and backs down. Catalysts and Hortensius, leading citizens, optimate stalwarts, Hortensius, one of Rome's greatest orators, they stand up to make some more speeches criticizing the bill, but they do it politely. Yes, Pompey perhaps would be the man for such a job, but citizens, such a job is unconstitutional. Booze. The crowd is unpersuaded. And anyway, can we really risk losing our greatest citizen? More booze. They're not having it. Finally, another tribune, Roscius, stands up to try to make a modest proposal that the command be given to two men instead of one. The assembly, though, is so tumultuous that nobody can even hear him. But then when he makes a gesture with two fingers and he mouths the words, two men, they realize what he means. A second man to balance Pompey out. Well... 
At that point, the citizenry lets out a sudden angry shout so loud that a raven flying overhead above the forum falls stunned out of the sky and down into the crowd, so the story goes. So that tactic didn't work either. By that time, it was getting toward evening. Gabinius adjourns the assembly and calls for a final vote a few days later. On the voting day, Pompey is conveniently absent, in retirement, in his country villa. And the now famous or infamous Gabinian law, the Lex Gabinia, passes in a landslide. Pompey, of course, as soon as he gets word, he's got to go celebrate with a party at his townhouse that night. But he does his best to soften the blow to the pride of the Senate, And he rides into the city after dark, so as to avoid stirring up the cheering crowds that would provoke the nobles' envy by underlining their humiliation. And a few days later, the Senate grudgingly ratifies the bill and adjusts to the new normal. By this time, Pompey, a meticulous planner, has been preparing for this moment for months. And he's already got the whole scheme for beating the pirates pretty well figured out. It was time to embark on his next adventure. We'll continue the story of how Pompey leveraged this incredible, unprecedented opportunity next time. But I want to pause here and do some analysis on Pompey and look at some lessons that we can learn from his singular rise to power. First is, Pompey cultivated the powerful, but he didn't want to become their permanent servant. We saw how Pompey impressed Carbo, Sulla, and other great men of the age. We didn't even talk about Marcius Philippus, who was a dominant force in the Senate in this era. He helped Pompey get this command against Sertorius. So Pompey cultivated relationships with them, but he also built his own source of leverage through his military competence, most of all, and the popularity that had brought him. So he was able to defy them, these great men, when the time came. I was listening to this interview with Jeremy Giffen, who's an investor, and he put it this way, talking about his experience in companies and his advice for an ambitious young guy trying to make his mark in a company is to stay off the org chart. That is, make yourself extremely useful to the company and especially to the principal of the company, the founder, the CEO, the boss. Develop some kind of standout relationship with them but don't have anybody else that you obviously report to. So you're the wonder boy, but nobody's really clear what your actual job title or rank is. They just know you're very important and you're favored by the founder, CEO, etc. And Pompey was totally not on the org chart in the Roman system until suddenly he was at the top of it in his first consulship around age 35. And staying out of the official framework gave him options with regards to patrons. But also when he went against his former mentors, he was sometimes able to pull this off without it leading to an open rift. Yes, okay, Sulla disinherited him, but hey, he didn't try to destroy him. And after Sulla's death, you know, he sort of patched things up and he honored the man's memory. To rise faster than others early on, you need patrons But if you're good, patrons can have a tendency to want to make you their right-hand guy. Poppy didn't want to be a right-hand guy. That kind of position can end up making you permanently number two. And if you don't want to be that, you need to be careful. And when it became time to make a break with his patron, when he asked for his first triumph from Sulla, Poppy was bold. And his very boldness made Sulla take him more seriously. The great German historian Matthias Geltzer emphasized that this was a lesson that Pompey learned from his dad, not least, the general Pompeius Strabo, who was a wild card in the Civil War. Both the populists and the optimates were never sure where he stood, and they knew they had to work hard to court him. Then I imagine Strabo sitting young Pompey down and saying, Always be your own man, son. Another thing that is kind of along these lines, for all that Pompey wanted to be number one and to keep rising way ahead of his contemporaries, 
He was also very sensitive to the danger of unnecessarily provoking envy, and he took pains to mitigate it. He stayed in his lane whenever he could, you know, avoiding the details of politics once he left the consulate, and also avoiding the glorious parade after his Lex Gabinia victory. And there are many other examples of this throughout his career. Finally, Pompey surrounded himself with talent. Not big names that did come later, but, you know, people like Varro, the scholar, Gabinius, the tribune. We haven't mentioned Titus Labienus, who's a brilliant general who is also there in Africa with him. There's also Petraeus and many others. And more specifically, though, I think he listened to these people. He was always learning, kind of like when he sees those books or like when he questioned the doomed Quintus Valerius. And we haven't even gotten to Theophanes the historian or Posidonius the Stoic or the other important man in Pompey's eventual retinue, Cicero. But Pompey sought the company and the counsel of highly intelligent men, and even though he was very good at what he did, he never assumed a priori that he knew better than these other men. You may be good at one thing, sales, software products, writing, finance, but to be at the top of any big game, you need to leverage the skills and insights that you don't have and can't have for yourself all on your own. And Pompey saw this very early on. We'll get some more great conquests and great trials that Pompey faced next time in part two. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. Stay strong. Stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Until next time.